fun because that is one of our favorite songs up at camp. So I felt like we were back at Summer Staff all, all singing that together this morning. Our scripture for this morning comes from Romans 12, verses 3 and 15 and 16. And Paul writes this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, Thanks be to God. Well, in a world of corporate, political, economic, and social hierarchy, Paul's words come to us this morning as a little bit of a hard sell. In our culture, people scramble and hustle to demonstrate how gifted, how qualified, how valuable, and how productive we are. No one wants to be at the bottom of the list or last in line or out of the loop. We don't want to be overlooked or undervalued, and we don't want to appear less than or inadequate. And so we seek out training on how to assert ourselves, on how to impress others, how to influence people. None, some of us desperately seek the approval of others. We bring accomplishments or attention to our accomplishments and talents. And we enjoy being the center of attention, and perhaps we occasionally even name drop when appropriate. And we see this hustle oftentimes in the church as well. And Paul points out that it's so dangerous, um, that spiritual pride is so dangerous, and how easy it is to fervently dedicate everything to God in one moment, and then in the next to be so puffed up with how amazing our dedication is to God in the next. So Paul is giving us an invitation in this scripture this morning. And as I sat with this uh, over the course this last week, just thinking about these words, I realized that Paul is giving us an invitation to live a life not characterized by thinking of ourselves more highly than, our, than we ought, but what does it mean to think of ourselves with sober judgment? To not be proud or conceited, but to live a life of humility. I love this definition of humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Have you heard this? But it's thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis wrote, and I love his language, Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man... He will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is a nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will probably be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If there's anything I've learned about humility in my journey, it is that it is something that I cannot produce on my own. It is not something that I can wake up in the morning and say, oh, today I am going to try to be really humble. Today I am going to start being a humble person. Instead, what I've discovered is that humility is this slow work of God in us over time. It is a fruit that we bear by spending time walking in close relationship with Jesus. When we practice spiritual disciplines that can put us in a place where God can transform us. So while we can't produce humility on demand... 
we can make a human effort, yes, by practicing small ways to think of ourselves with sober judgment, and in essence, to learn how to die to ourselves. I love Dallas Willard, um, theologian and author, says, grace is not opposed to effort, it is opposed to earning. And so we make a human effort in which we partner with God in our own process of transformation. And we do that by training exercises, just like we train for a marathon. And we can't run out, go leave this room and run a marathon right now, but we can engage in training over time that will enable us to run a marathon even though we can't do it today. And that's exactly what these spiritual exercises are all about. And so as I read this passage from Paul, I felt like there were several training exercises he was inviting us into from this passage. C.S. Lewis again said, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And it's a biggish step too, he says. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Ouch. So maybe the very first practice that Paul is inviting us into through these words this morning is to just be honest about our pride. Maybe a good spiritual exercise for you and I today is to sit down with Jesus and to ask him to show us what things are sources of pride for me. I think it may be my kids or my career or my accomplishments or my competencies. What is it, God? Show me. And what about these things make me feel proud? Why do I think I've earned these on my own? And how might you, God, be inviting me to think about these things differently? Richard Rohr says, humility and honesty are really the same thing. A humble person is simply a brutally honest person about the whole truth. You and I came along a few years ago, we're going to be gone in a few years, and the only honest response to God is a humble one. Some of you my age and older may have grown up listening to or may have heard or listened to the music of Amy Grant. Now, I was a child of the 80s, and so I had four older siblings, and we listened to Amy Grant. And in an interview with Amy Grant, after she had gone through a deeply painful divorce and later married Vince Gill, a Christian interviewer kind of blindsided her in this interview. And he turned on his tape recorder, and the first words out of his mouth were, you are deceitful, you are awful, you are a liar, and you are horrible. And before her manager could jump in and intervene in this interview, Amy responded without even flinching, oh, I'm so much worse than you think I am. But by the grace of God, I get up every morning and I put one foot in front of the other. Ironically, when the Christian culture at large was canceling her with righteous pride and indignation, she responded with a deep sense of honesty and humility. What a beautiful and a freeing thing when we can be brutally honest about the whole truth about ourselves and simply be who we are, no more and no less when we are free to let go what people think of us and free from seeking the approval of others because the truth is there is a God and it's not me. And I am broken and flawed but deeply, deeply loved daughter of God. I love the messages version of James 2.1 that says, my dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out your glorious Christ-originated faith. Let's get brutally honest about our pride. The next practice that Paul encourages us in this text is to do is to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. 
This is a super practical way that we can consider others better than ourselves. When we listen to others with compassion and empathy, we get outside of ourselves and realize that life is not all about us. We are not the center of the world. Henry Nouwen talks about this idea that hospitality is a friendly, empty space. We talk about this up at Calvin Crest a lot, that that's our goal for our guests, is to create a friendly, empty space where friend and stranger can enter in. But the problem is, is that if the space around me, as Tiffany, if my space is always filled with Tiffany, and I am always talking and thinking and radiating all things about myself, there isn't a friendly, empty space for you to enter in. And so I think Paul is inviting us here when he says, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice, is to create this friendly, empty space where others can enter in and we can share our humanity with one another. A helpful question might be to ask ourselves, when did I last hold space for someone else other than myself? When did I last hold space for someone that just needed to laugh or cry or do anything in between? Or how about this? Am I willing to put away my technology so that I can hold space for others? I have been increasingly convicted about the space that my phone holds in, my, in the space surrounding Tiffany. Um, I have learned, as my husband and I have talked, of what that does to him when my fo phone lays on the dinner table, um, even if it's face down, um, and the space that that occupies knowing that at a moment's notice, I could be distracted and suddenly something else will become more priority over him in that moment. And so I'm practicing, it's a spiritual practice for me these days to put my phone away when I'm in the presence of others so that I can be completely present and focused. That is how I am practicing mourning with those who mourn and rejoicing with those who rejoice. A third practice that Paul mentions is to live in harmony with one another. And I was thinking this week as I read this scripture, like, oh, I think I live in harmony with others. I think that's like, that's, I'm doing pretty well with that one. And then I started to think about people when I'm driving. <laughs> now you're laughing. I'm assuming that you resonate with that. I started thinking about people in the grocery store. I started thinking about people who are on their phones on speakerphone in a coffee shop or a restaurant when I'm trying to talk and, and there's really loud conversations on phones going on. And I started thinking, hmm, am I just living at harmony with those that I like? Am I just living in harmony with those that have my same political interests and beliefs? Am I just living in harmony with the person in the Starbucks drive through that buys my drink for me? Um, unexpectedly, but what about the person that cuts me off in traffic? Or what about the person who gossips about me and slanders me? Or the person who falsely accuses me? So the practice here is asking God to help me bless those people instead of curse them. I had a mentor once that said, you know, when someone is cursing you, the last thing they need in return is to have you curse them back. What they really need is for you to bless them. That's what they need, desperately. And so here, Paul is inviting us. What does it look like to live in harmony with one another? And not just the people I like and agree with, but with everyone I come into contact with. And finally, Paul encourages us to be willing to associate with those in a low position. And I don't believe that Paul is telling us to do this because it's good for those in a low position. I believe that Paul is telling us that we need this. It is good for us. 
In 2008, I went to Zambia, Africa, to train leaders and teachers who were working on transforming a village. More than 85% of Zambians live on less than $2 a day. Most of their living conditions are deplorable. And so the first evening, we went to what was called the Hope House. It was an orphanage where children who were orphaned and poor and viewed as the lowest position in society welcomed us by singing some songs for us. And this is what I wrote in my journal that night. Our team, all the children, and all the house mothers crammed into this tiny living room And when the children began singing, it was one of the most moving moments I have ever experienced. They lifted their hands and sang in full voice in Bemba, give thanks to the Lord who has made a way when we had no way. There is none like him. It was the purest worship I think I have ever heard, and I couldn't stop the tears from flowing. Words can't describe what it is like to see and hear these orphans who have lost everything dear to them, declaring their hope and love for the God who sustains them. It is a moment I will never forget. They are rich in a way that I am not. I am poor in a way that they don't know. When we associate with those of low position, so to speak, whether it be across the world or across the street, it changes us. And Paul knew that. We become people who are more humble. We realize the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The vision that Paul gives us to become the kinds of people who ultimately look like the one we follow, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Yet he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. By God's grace, May we internalize these words of Paul today and may may we become the kinds of people who are characterized by deep humility. Let's pray. God, thank you for this challenge. I thank you for it personally. God, we confess that we are people who all too easily take pride in all the wrong things. We put all the stock in all the things that we've done or that we've acquired or accomplished. And God, this morning, we just want to take account. We want to confess our pride. We want to become more like you. We want to be people um, who bring a deep sense of love and grace and compassion and humility in our world. And so we pray that you would change us, that you would stir in us today, that you would call us to these small spiritual practices that you can use over time to change who we are from the inside out. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.